Welcome to the Launching Legacy podcast, the future of aviation and aerospace. The show where we unpack how aviation and aerospace companies are launching into their next level of growth and what's on the horizon for the sector as a whole post-COVID. My name is Katrina Douglas, your host, and I've been helping organizations increase their marketing effectiveness since 2006. And I'm excited to share some extraordinary insights from the aviation and aerospace industry on what lies ahead and how we together can increase the visibility of the industry and the companies in it. Hi everyone, welcome to the very first episode of Launching Legacy, the future of aviation and aerospace. I am so excited to be interviewing some incredible people from the aerospace and aviation industry, starting with Mike Lawson. Welcome, Mike. Hi, Katrina. (laughs) It's such a pleasure to meet you and be on this amazing campus. And we connected, I guess, maybe a month or so... Your memory's going to be far better than mine. Yeah, it feels like about a month ago. Yeah, on LinkedIn, yeah. because I was trawling LinkedIn, just um, wanting to find people in the space that I thought were interesting, innovators, entrepreneurs, business leaders, and I came across you, and you kindly accepted my invitation and agreed to have a chat. And um, yeah, I'm just really excited to get stuck into the conversation. So thank you for joining me thanks for the opportunity glad to be here absolutely so mike i always like to start with the question what's your story how did you get here how did i get here being i guess a now a tech entrepreneur yes. um i as a small boy i was a constant fiddler of, of things yeah. and my earliest childhood memory is actually being electrocuted by our color tv Wow. I was fascinated about how the picture was being formed. Yeah. So when I was left alone, my mm. friends were out of the room, I found a screwdriver and I took the back off the TV. And of course, I'm old enough that in those days, you had a big cafe <laughs> tube. Yeah, the big tube TVs. And yeah. there's a lot of high voltage back there. Uh, and I found out as a small boy yeah. <laughs> that, yeah, that can be really wow. quite, uh, yeah, quite brutal. So I was pushed back across the room and oh just became goodness. fascinated with technology and, yeah. and energy. Uh, and then I ended up getting in trouble a few months later when I was at my grandparents' house and my nan was playing a piano mm-hmm. and I thought, how is that sound being generated? Yeah. And then ended up being told off for taking the back of the piano to work out how the sound was created. Yeah. So I think from a young age, I've always been a fiddler and fascinated with technology. Yeah. Excellent. So you have started quite a few companies in space and tech. Um, can you tell me about that journey? Because... It was really fascinating to see how you have been able to take a scientific engineering background and marry that with entrepreneurship, because I think a lot of times the two seem quite mutually exclusive. You don't find many people that are as engineering and scientifically minded as they are entrepreneurial, and you are. So how did that all start? I think for me, technology is valuable if you get it out there in the world so people can either use it or or enjoy it. Uh, And I have nothing against guys that just want to do research. But for me, what is more personally fulfilling is seeing ideas go through that um, uh, kind of discovery phase, the development phase, but then really excitingly being deployed in the real world. So I became not just fascinated about the technical fit, you know, solving a problem in the real world, but the commercial aspects. Yeah. You know, why do some technologies fail and others succeed? Uh, and I'm old enough once again to remember the, the war against VHS mm-hmm. and Betamax. Yeah. VHS won out, mm-hmm. but it was the technically inferior system mm-hmm. to Betamax. Mm-hmm. And that was a great example to me of, you can have a, a brilliant technology superior in many, many ways, yeah. but it fell on its face for commercial reasons. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought I'd love to bring those two worlds together. And my career has really been, I guess, that. Yeah. Trying to find great ideas, great teams to work with me to build really smart ideas and then overlay it with a really compelling commercial case. Yeah. So can you take me through the journey from the first company to where we are now with Oxford Dynamics? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, the first company I ever started, I was probably 11 or 12. Mm-hmm. And I convinced myself that if I could fix things for my neighbors, they, they would pay me. Yeah. Um, so my engineering skills were obviously quite limited. Mm-hmm. So it was, um, you know, putting 
back, you know, tidying up the back of loose radios and things and repairing the neighbor's bike, that sort of stuff. Yeah. And, and I was paid for that. So yeah. technically that was that my, was first, my, my first yeah. tech business. Tech business. <laughs> um, but then more seriously, um, after um, an apprenticeship actually mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in a shipyard where I was working on nuclear submarines and, uh, and frigates, um, that was my first real exposure, I guess, to kind of deep tech. Yeah. And that showed me that engineering is a compromise between the ideal and then the real world implementation. Yeah. Uh, and all the um, conflicting design challenges you need to go through to go from a brilliant idea to actually something you can use in the real world. Mm -hmm. And I'll cut out a huge chunk of, of my career, which included a stint as, as a DJ and working for the BBC <laughs> and, and running bars, um, into uh, the first tech company I actually founded was called Future Tech. Okay. And that gave rise to two internal ideas, mm -hmm. which then gave rise to two other companies. Yeah. One was focused on solving a problem that I um, experienced when I was working my way through university. Yeah. Uh, and I became fascinated with drinks quality, believe okay. it or not. Yeah. And I became amazed and surprised that through the course of the evening, you could actually substitute premium, uh, cheap beer brands for premium brands. So for instance, someone ordered a Stella, you can actually give them, you know, Fosters or something. Yeah. And I thought, this is a really interesting challenge for the industry because if I can give away or substitute beer, other people can do this. Yeah. And the reason you want to do that is you can actually pocket the difference in, okay. in till. Okay. I wasn't committing fraud, actually. Must be. <laughs> I was just fascinated by how you could swap out drinks. And yeah. I thought, this must be a big problem for the brand owners. Yeah. So how do you solve this? Um, and the other challenge, which I'm sure we've all experienced, if you go into a bar and you ask for a drink, you take a sip. It doesn't taste sometimes like the drink you had last time. Yes. So that brand consistency, brand integrity mm. is a real challenge. Of course, you only know what you sold, not what you didn't exactly. sell, and therefore loss of sales. So I ended up inventing, I guess, an intelligent tongue or intelligent flow meter mm -hmm. that could be retrofitted to every bar dispense tap. Yeah. Uh, and every time you open the dispense tap, it would log critical things associated mm. with quality. So long before we were talking about Internet of Things, yeah. the, the old word used to be telemetry. Wow. So and before the wonders of, of Wi-Fi, I was hardwiring all my flow sensors together into um, a very early PC, an old 286. This mm -hmm. would collect some of the data. Uh, and I did a deal with one of the large uh, mobile phone companies mm -hmm. in the UK that I could use some of the dead time between 2 o'clock and 5 o'clock in the morning. I'd have an old dial-up modem <laughs> that would then give me this really raw data, we would then process it overnight and deliver the first quality management wow. reports to some of the big brand owners. Wow. So I built that business up and customers included uh, folks like uh, Heineken and mm. Diageo and Guinness. Uh, yeah, built, built that business up and sold it to, to a competitor. Wow. So that was my, my first tech venture. And when was that? That was back in the uh, very early 2000s, okay. probably kind of 2000, 2001. Yeah. 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 And the other idea we had, that was kind of company number one. Company number two was called um, Regenatech, mm -hmm. and that was focusing on biofuels. Yeah. And I mentioned I was working at, in a bar at university. Mm -hmm. um, to get to my year out, where I was doing my placement here right. on this campus, wow. it was a 400 mile round trip. Okay. I couldn't afford the diesel fuel because yeah. I was being an impoverished student and beer bills were, were high. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and I stumbled across an article from uh, an engineering magazine and it was talking about diesel engines and how the diesel engine was never ever originally designed to run on fossil fuel. Wow. It was designed to run on peanut oil. <laughs> Believe it or not. Rudolf Diesel, the guy who invented wow. diesel engine or the compression ignition engine as it should be called, visionary guy, he thought the world would become dependent on fossil fuels. Okay. So to break that monopoly, invented an engine that could compress a vaporized oil mixture, mm -hmm. combust it and release the energy. Yeah. And he demonstrated a peanut powered diesel engine at the World Trade Fair, I think in 1894, okay. running on granite oil. Well, yeah. We call it granite oil, peanut yeah. oil. Yeah. So I thought, can I make a modern diesel engine <laughs> run on, on plant oil? And the answer is yes, you can. Um, so I converted my car, saved myself a huge fortune going to and from this campus 
for my year out. I thought this was probably an exciting technology here. Yeah. The world was then becoming really quite excited about carbon footprints and mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. And a long story short, built that business up. I became Green Entrepreneur of the Year in 2009 for India. Mm -hmm. I did a joint venture in India to grow essentially oil from uh, from weeds mm -hmm. in, in, in India. Mm -hmm. Built that business up and, and sold that one as well. Wow. Okay. Uh, and to complete the story, uh, I then did a brief stint for a, a space company. I was kind of almost entrepreneur in yeah. residence, yeah. spotted an opportunity, which then gave rise to my first uh, aerospace company, okay. which was Oxford Space Systems, yeah. which I founded in 2013. Okay. And that is focusing and still is focusing on developing really novel, large antennas and okay. deployable antenna systems for satellites. Yeah and grew that from just an idea to the highest valued space tech startup in the UK. Incredible, incredible. And we set a world record for the fastest time going from a blank sheet of paper to some technology successfully demonstrated on, on orbit. That's incredible. And can you tell me a bit more about that? Because I remember when we spoke about it, you spoke about um, coming together with an origami specialist. Yes. Like, can you tell, tell us about that? It actually comes back to your uh, previous question about being interested in engineering. Yeah. You know, what makes uh, an engineering or commercial uh, a technical product successful? Mm -hmm. And it's that killer bit of differentiation. Yeah. How do we get large antenna systems mm -hmm. to fit in ever smaller spaces? Yeah. And of course, origami is the skill of folding things in a really efficient way. So I thought, can we make a new generation of space antennas based on the latest origami principles? And the answer is, is yes. Mm -hmm. And I managed to find a world expert in origami literally just 10 miles away, mm -hmm. uh, a guy called uh, Professor Zong Yu. Mm -hmm. I called him on a Friday afternoon. I said, you don't know me at all, um, Professor, but here's a really interesting challenge. Is this something you might want to get involved in? He got so excited that he insisted I go to his lab the following wow. day. So Saturday morning, I, I went to his lab and I thought it was just going to be a quick chat over coffee and we mm. kind of agreed to talk next. Uh, and I remember being in his lab at four o'clock. We were about seven or eight hours together kind of thrashing through how we might develop some really, really kind of killer ideas. Um, yeah, and then took those ideas to orbit. Wow. And so that was the fastest time to market of a... Space project, you said. Um, we didn't have a company at the time, we yeah. just had an idea. So we formed the company, built the team, designed, developed, and tested the technology, and then flew it and got photo, uh, photographs back from orbit of the technology working in just over 22 months. Wow, incredible. And you didn't stop there, did you, Mike? You didn't stop there <laughs> at all. You're still going. So yeah. tell us about your um, current company, Oxford Dynamics. Yeah, so I stood down as CEO of the company I founded, Oxford Space Systems, at the back end of 2019. Mm -hmm. And I can't stop myself, I've been going to another company. Um, and fortuitous meetings, as often quite happened in business, yeah. um, met a co-founder, a guy yeah. called Dr. Eddie Jackson, mm -hmm. and together with uh, someone who worked for me at Oxford Space Systems, yeah. Shafali Sharma, yeah. the three of us came together as, as the Holy Trinity, as I call yeah. it, uh, each with unique skills, and decided to form Oxford Dynamics. Yeah. And Oxford Dynamics is focusing on developing a new generation of artificial intelligence mm -hmm. with a strong robotics element to the business as well. Yeah. And the idea is to bring these two worlds together, yeah. ultimately. Incredible. So let's speak about the Pampers because you've been here now, your whole career, I guess, has been on this campus. And when I arrived here um, earlier today, there's such a sense of just, I don't know, maybe it's in the air of just the future and just the idea that so many incredible minds are on this campus. You're solving some of the world's biggest problems. And I think... Um, one of the gentlemen we were speaking to said that it's the only place in the world with over a hundred space companies within walking distance. So, and most people don't know that this place exists. So. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think uh, Harwell is an unknown gem, not just yeah. in the UK, but globally. Yeah. And you're absolutely right, over a hundred space companies now on campus. I think there's about 350 tech companies now on campus mm -hmm. with a population of about six and a half thousand, seven thousand. Yeah. Really, really smart people yeah. doing cutting edge engineering and very few people know about it. Yeah. 
Yeah. It, it's fascinating. So we just want to put the Harwell campus on the map because just what an amazing, amazing place. Just the feel of it. The And I know the sun is shining, so that probably... <laughs> that helps. But, you know, it's just such an incredible place. So um, I think it's going to be increasingly important for the aerospace, aerospace sector to be more entrepreneurial, especially because, you know... People just don't know what an impact the UK is having, having. And I just think in order to really fully put the UK on the map, it doesn't just need the, the, the bright minds. It needs the visibility. It needs the exposure. People need to understand outside the sector how incredible the space is, um, especially as we move into the commercialization of space. So as we go, uh, before we go into you know, the depths mm. of the visibility of the industry. What do we mean by the commercialization of space? I think a great example, and, and I use this analogy quite often, is with the computer industry. Yeah. If you think back to where we were in the late 50s and, and 60s with computers, uh, I think the chairman of IBM famously said on record he did not think the world would require more than four or five mm. mainframes. Yeah. They didn't actually see the future applications of computing technology. And of course, back then, computers were incredibly expensive. You needed teams of people to run those first mainframe computers. And of course, you had to be a government to, to, to buy this technology. Yeah. So that gave rise to certain incumbent players like IBM that were making exquisitely complex and expensive machines that only essentially nation states could afford. Yeah. But now that where we are with computers, You've got one in your hand. Uh, we've, we've lost count of how many computers we, we all own. Yeah. And that is in less than the span of one person's lifetime. Mm. Technology has gone phenomenally uh, fast forward with computing technology. Yeah. And I think we're on the same sort of cusp with space technology. So in the same way, the exquisitely expensive computers, we have exquisitely expensive spacecraft. Yeah. And the first satellites ever launched, incredibly expensive, could only be afforded by, by governments. Yeah. And that gave rise to the incumbent players that we still have today yeah. being the only companies that could afford these massive teams to put together these incredibly exquisite, expensive satellites mm -hmm. and then look after them. But in the same way, technology has advanced and revolutionized computer technology. That is now being applied to the space sector. Okay. Yeah. So now we're seeing much, much smaller, much cheaper, more capable spacecraft. Yeah. And that's given rise to entrepreneurs coming yeah. into the industry. Yeah. In the same way we have computer entrepreneurs working yeah. at how we apply this new technology. Now it's become so readily accessible, almost disposable, when you start yeah. thinking about CubeSats. This has given rise to fantastic commercial opportunities and a whole bunch of fresh blood coming to industry. Yeah. And now we're getting the challenge of the dynamic, the large incumbent spacecraft builders being challenged by startups, yeah. you know, the uprights, the, yeah. uh, yeah. the usurpers yeah. of the industry. And we're going yeah. through that, that disruption at the moment. Yeah. I think the more we see that, the more the profile of the industry is going to yeah, raise. absolutely. So what advice would you give to more traditional companies that have been here for a long time but aren't as entrepreneurial and moving into this next phase of growth. Hire some fresh blood. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think, and you, and you can see why, because they, they are very risk adverse, mm -hmm. they're large operational mm -hmm. concerns, and that's not a criticism of them, it's the very nature of the customers they used to serve. Yeah. You know, guess, governments are really risk adverse. Yeah. They don't like disruption, mm -hmm. they like incremental improvements. Yeah. So if you look at the large incumbents in the industry, although the term disruption is thrown about by large incumbents, what they're actually locked into doing is incremental improvements. Mm. How do we make roughly the same technology a bit cheaper? Yeah. Or how do we make a slight tweak to this without scaring our customer yeah. base? Whereas if you're an entrepreneur, you're not trying, you're actually targeting different customers yeah. and you yeah. want genuine dis customers that want genuine disruption. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot easier to disrupt if you're a startup. Yeah. So if you're an incumbent, you need to find a way of entertaining disruption in, inside an operationally safe business. Yeah. And I think that needs like a mini skunk works to be set up, yeah. a mini entrepreneur department yeah. where you have the latitude for taking risks. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess maybe just um, encouraging a culture of entrepreneurship as well. So even within your organization, just 
and I guess the best way to do that is to bring in fresh, fresh blood again. But the, the challenge, yeah. even it happens at the interview level, of course, people yeah. tend to hire people that think and even look yeah. like them. Yeah. So if you're working in a large risk adverse company, yeah. you're probably risk adverse yeah, yourself. That's true. So are you really true. gonna hire the crazy entrepreneur that's to come true. in? Yeah. So it goes right back to that hiring phase. Yeah. And one thing um, large companies are obsessed about, yeah. as are the people that uh, give them money, that could be customers mm. and, and governments. We love predictability. Mm. We want to see cash flow forecasts going out three, five, you know, even yeah. seven years on, on some projects. But disruption, by the very nature, you can't predict yeah. how much you're going to be spending or earning, say, in three years' yeah. time. But the mindset to sign off genuine uh, disruption wants to see the numbers in the Excel spreadsheet yeah. in three years' time. Yeah. So it's breaking that mindset about trusting smart people to do really clever things yeah. when they can't give you the answers you traditionally go looking for. Yeah, incredible. So the UK, and I think one of the things that was most exciting to me and why in this podcast I really want to highlight the UK in particular, by the very nature of aerospace, it's a global business. But I did not know how impactful the UK was. And you gave me some stats when we spoke about the UK having put you know, 50% of the satellites that are in space, in space. And the fact that we have Harwell here, which is the, you know, I cannot, it's beyond me that nobody knows how much impact the UK has in, in the sector. So can you talk to us about that? Yeah, you hit on a very important point. Um, I find it fascinating that even if you don't drive a car or own a car, you can probably reel off five car brands. Yeah. Yeah. We all use space technology. Every time you touch your smartphone, wow. you're interfacing to technology that's on orbit. Can anybody name just one UK space company? No. But we use the technology. Oh. So we've got a big problem. We've got a big problem. Um, and, it's, and it's pretty obvious when you look into it why that might be the case. If you look at the amount of money that the automotive industry spends on promotion. Yeah. Uh, you know, it runs to comfortably double digits in terms of revenue that gets spent yeah. on promotion. If you look at how much the space sector spends on promotion, mm -hmm. you're struggling to find single-digit investment. Yeah. So to me, it's not really a surprise of kind of why we are where we are. Yeah. Uh, and I also think engineers tend to be um, less, shall we say, flamboyant yeah. and wanting to promote themselves. Yeah. And as we were talking earlier, especially involved in R&D, that's a great way to flatten a big ego because yeah. <laughs> most of the stuff you're going to work on uh, is probably going to go bang yeah. or fall over or smoke. Um, so it lends itself to, I think, the perhaps more reserved approach. Mm. But I still think that's a phenomenal opportunity yeah, for those that are is. willing to come to the sector and, it and promote. It's almost an open playing field. Yeah. So I guess what... What is the general perception of marketing and promotion in the space? Do within a company, did you have a marketing department? Are there are there marketing departments? What is the yeah, what is the perception of marketing in the in the space and promotion? Um that's a great question. And I think to most engineers, marketing promotion is seen as a dirty word. And yeah. that's not really a skill. Why why would you bother? Yeah. You know, isn't the technology <laughs> self-evident? Yeah. Uh, I think that's the challenge. Yeah. Of course, large aerospace companies do have very mm -hmm. uh, mature uh, mm -hmm. and well-structured marketing and PR departments, but they're generally set up to promote their offering to yeah. their key customers. Yeah. It's le much less about promoting it to, to the wider public. Mm -hmm. But we are seeing things change, and, uh, and I'll cite the, the Farnborough uh, yeah. Air and Space Show that yeah. we now have. It's great that at the weekends we now have the public day, mm. or the public days, yeah. where they can walk around the, the, the trade stands. Yeah. I think that's a great step forward, yeah, but is. why aren't we specifically having those large companies promoting to the public? Because those stands don't have to be manned, for instance. Absolutely. So I think I think there's opportunities being, being lost. Yeah. Um, and the more we see space being commercialized and Right or wrongly, if you, you don't particularly be a fan of, of Elon Musk, right or wrongly, he's raised the profile yes. of the space sector yeah. and how exciting space technology yeah. can be. Yeah, excellent. So speaking of promoting the sector, what are, say, three things you would want people to know about the future of aerospace and where it's going? The future of aerospace? Yeah. So you're not just restricting me to above the clouds. No. 
<laughs> so I, I think the, the UK can certainly be a leader in what we call beyond line of sight, okay. drones and drones delivery, UAV delivery. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we are probably leading in the sort of technology that will mm -hmm. enable that. Yeah. And we're now waiting for legislation to catch up. Okay. Yeah. So I think we can see some really exciting developments uh, in the UK on that front. Yeah. Uh, we're just taking our first baby steps into launching satellites from the UK. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, look, the first one <laughs> didn't work, but we nearly got there. We nearly got there, yeah. Um, and is that going to knock us back? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. You know, there's teams of guys pouring over, and girls pouring over what went wrong with that launch, and it's going to be back, you know, bigger, brighter, yeah. uh, and better. So a launch capability from yeah. the UK, being able to stay on UK soil, mm -hmm. drive and watch rockets going into Just orbit. Incredible. And I think we are going to continue our dominance in the so-called small sat and microsat market. Mm -hmm. you know, over 50% of small sats on, on orbits yeah. have been built in the UK and certainly have contained UK technology. Yeah. Um, so kind of more of the same as we move to so-called mega constellations. Yeah. So we're going to move from the kind of 10, 15,000 satellites we've got on orbit to literally hundreds of thousands of satellites. The UK is at the forefront of building that sort of technology. So to have the first mega constellation, small sat company in the UK would be a phenomenal achievement. Wow. And what is a mega constellation? Uh, choose the name mega, big. Okay. So typically, you know, we would fly constellations, say GPS, yes. that's around yes. about what, 35, 38 satellites. It's, yeah. a, it's a reasonable constellation. Yeah. If we now move to a new generation of internet direct from mm -hmm. orbit and in future, you know, your mobile phone will have to talk direct to, to a satellite. Uh, to get the sort of seamless coverage we want, we're going to need tens of thousands of satellites on, yeah. on orbit. Yeah. Plus you need backups as well. Okay. So we're going to start to move to constellations of many, many thousands of satellites and therefore we call them mega constellations. Okay. So what... Um, you spoke about AI. You spoke about your current company being involved with AI, and AI is a is a huge topic yeah. right now. So, what is the intersection between AI and aerospace? Where, what what types of things are we seeing between the two? Yeah, so so where my world in my new world uh, of Oxford Dynamics links yeah. into my old world of of, of Oxford Space Systems is when we talk about these mega constellations. Yeah. Historically, we've had a small number of satellites on orbit and yeah. everyone has been manually controlled from the ground. Yeah. But when you think about it, if we're putting tens or even hundreds of thousands of satellites on orbit eventually, the idea of manually controlling every one of those satellites yeah. isn't going to happen. Yeah. So we need to move to semi-autonomous and then ultimately fully autonomous constellations. Yeah. But in order for something to become semi-autonomous and then ultimately autonomous, yeah. it needs a really, really deep understanding of the environment that it finds itself in the yes. world around it. And that means we're going to need a new generation of sensing technology, mm -hmm. and much more importantly, a new generation of artificial intelligence okay. that can take very complex sensor information and reduce that down to a very accurate understanding of the environment and then take decisions mm -hmm. based on the situation in which it finds yeah. itself. Yeah. Most people have heard about self-driving cars yes. and some of the challenges we're having there. So we're starting to see these baby steps of technology becoming semi-autonomous mm -hmm. on orbit with aerospace. Um, those satellites ultimately need to be self-contained, you know, intelligent machines that can yeah. fly themselves in the right formation. And when we get to UAVs as well, if we're flying beyond line of sight, um, if it comes across a hazard that the operator owner is not aware of, you want that UAV not to collide into it. Yeah. You want it to take intelligent avoiding action. Yeah. So this is where the worlds come together. Okay. And there might be some people watching this that are thinking, okay, well, that's all incredible, but what does aerospace and space have to do with me? And you spoke about, you know, when we even touch our phones, there's space technology in it. And I think for me, it's really important to bridge this gap between the experts in space and this incredible inertia that we have with general business people, yeah. general public, because, yeah, I just think it's really, really important in this next phase where I guess almost the two worlds are colliding. Can you talk to us about why it's relevant to the everyday man and why we should care? I think the industry has given itself a challenge. It's worked on making these technologies so seamless, so painless to use 
that we don't even recognize that we're using these technologies. So I think there's a big, big challenge for the tech. Um, uh, imagine not having even GPS. Mm. So very what we take for granted. Wow. Wow. How are you going to navigate? There, we have people alive now that have never looked at a paper map. Yeah. Perhaps don't even know they exist. Yes. The only way they get around is by looking at their phone. Yeah. So there's an example of a technology that we've become so dependent yeah. upon that we can't live without. But anybody who's actually bought a lottery ticket, believe it or not, that data is relayed by a satellite link. Wow. Um, if you've ever watched a, a broadcast coming live from the other side of the world, you're know, watching a football game or tennis game, that signal is being bounced off a geostationary wow. satellite. If you make a phone call now, if you're yeah. using you know, WhatsApp, invariably, if you're talking to a certain part of the world, those signals are being bounced through space as well. Yeah. So we use space technology multiple times a day. Yeah. We just don't realize don't it. Know it. Yeah, because the whole idea of the industry is let's make this seamlessly painless to use. Yeah. But instead of doing so, I think it's kind of disappeared off the radar screen yeah. for most people. Incredible. So what's next for you, Mike? What's next at Oxford Dynamics? Um, yeah, what is next for you? Um, so Oxford Dynamics is one of the companies yeah. that, that I've uh, co-founded, and that's on a really interesting trajectory at the cutting edge of, uh, of artificial um, intelligence. Um, but a personal project that came from uh, an actual personal need of needing to look after my elderly parents that I was mm. living a long distance away from. Um, it came to a point of, of a personal tragedy where, where I think um, at least one of my parents died prematurely simply because I didn't know what was going on with them. They, they were living alone, uh, both quite ill. And, and I noticed, and it seems to be a common theme, the one certainty is if you call a distant relative, they're going to lie to you. Yes. They don't want to cause the trouble, yes. they want to be a fuss. Yes. And that could be the most frustrating yeah. thing in the world. Um, so long story short, my, my, both my parents, I think, died prematurely because they were living alone and, and not really uh, mm. uh, not really telling me what was going on. Mm. So I thought we need the digital equivalent of a concerned neighbor yeah. that they don't need to interact with, they don't need to touch, they just basically ignore it. Mm. And then if something is going wrong in that living environment, either gradually yeah. or maybe there's an accident, I could be alerted instantly. Yeah. And therefore, I could take appropriate action. Yeah. So it's not a medical diagnostic tool. It's not trying to replace any of the emergency services. It's just giving me and hopefully other people peace of mind yeah. um, that they're being looked after and looked over. Um, and that's given rise to another company called Oxlabs. Yeah. And the technology I've just described is called Habitat. Okay. And we are building our first prototypes at the moment, and we'll have them out this year. And already, we've got strong interest from uh, Japan. Yeah. And the world's largest telecoms provider yeah. is very interested in potentially profiling that technology in Japan, which happens to have the world's oldest demographic. Yeah. So a great place to, to start with that sort of technology. Incredible. And like I was saying to you, I can totally relate. You know, my granddad is 98. He's been in great health. And, you know, he's still at home. We don't want to move him out of his home. But we are at that point where we kind of want to know and watch him a little bit closer. And so I can totally relate. And I think the opportunity for this is huge. And I think, you know, just thinking about all the companies you started, I think what is so fascinating um, to me, Mike, is that your ability to take big tech, engineering, sophisticated science and bring it and uh, incorporate it to solve really common everyday problems that we can all relate to and I think that's the common thread that I'm seeing through your companies and it's it's just amazing and I think I guess that's why you have such an entrepreneurial flair because the science and the tech is up here but actually the solutions are down here and you've just been able to combine the two and if you continue to do that I can't actually ever see you stopping I want to be the world's oldest entrepreneur <laughs> if, I, if I'm starting a company when I'm 94 that's success because uh, it doesn't feel like work. You know, I'm doing what I enjoy doing. I'm working with people that are far technically brighter than me. So I surround myself by really, really smart people. Yeah. And I'm just the glue that kind of perhaps spots yeah. problems and kind of let's work out how we're going to do this commercially yeah. and just bring people uh, yeah. together. 
and hopefully they really enjoy solving the sorts yeah. of problems that, uh, that we're working on. Absolutely, it's so important, um, so, so important. And I just hope that entrepreneurial flair that you have really does filter through the industry because I think it's absolutely necessary to go into that next level of growth. So my final question to you is, what advice do you have for companies that want to launch into this next level of growth, this time and space where it's getting more commercial and the, the cavern, cavern, the whole, the space between the public, general businesses and space is getting yeah. smaller. What advice do you have for them as we launch into this next? It actually comes back to, I think, an answer on a previous question. It's about embracing risk. Yeah. You're hiring people that perhaps are outside your comfort zone, yeah. trusting them, giving them the space to explore genuine disruption. Yeah. Because I think that's when the magic really happens. Yeah. If you force people to be in a risk adverse environment and force them to hit a financial target in three quarters time, don't expect a lot of disruptive technology. You know, it's going to be risk adverse. Yeah. But I also think now in, in the UK, there's been no better time to start your own business. Yeah. Uh, and I say to people, your most valuable resource is your time. Yeah. It's the one thing you can never replace. Mm. Why are you selling chunks of your life to somebody else? Yeah. Absolutely. Why not give it a go? And I think the younger you are, the much, much better chance you have of success. Yeah. And you're much more willing to embrace risk when you're young. Absolutely. You, know, you probably don't have a mortgage yet. Yeah. You probably don't have a, <laughs> you probably haven't married somebody yet. You probably don't have kids yet. Yeah. You know, all those things yeah. that make us risk averse. Yeah. Uh, the only thing you probably don't have is a lot of money. Yeah. But then be entrepreneurial. Yeah. I started with, with no money yeah. and I worked it. Yeah. You know, the way I had to do that. Yeah. So I just tell people to go for it. And the absolute worst thing you can possibly do, I think, in your early 20s, even if you fail mm -hmm. and, and you think, oh, crikey, I need to go and get a job now. CVs that came into OSS, my mm -hmm. Oxford Space Systems, the people who I really wanted to interview were those that gave it a go and perhaps yeah. it didn't work out. Yeah. Because you've now massively enhanced your CV. Absolutely. You know how tough it is to start a tech business or start yeah. a business. You're now going to be so commercially aware and savvy. Yeah. You're an incredibly valuable asset to, mm -hmm. to a business. So thinking it's failure, it isn't. You've gained an incredibly valuable life experience. That's the downside. Yeah. The upside is you could have a really successful exactly. business and become a really successful entrepreneur. Absolutely. How is that loss in any, in way? any way? So just just go for it. It really isn't. Well, thank you so much, Mike. You know, our slogan at the launch strategy is launching legacy. And for me, I'm passionate about talking to, working with true legacy builders. And I think you are that. And I think the, the businesses that you have built and started will have um, an impact for generations to come. So thank you. Well, thank you. It's been an honor speaking to you. And I'm excited to see the incredible stuff you built and also to see this um, piece of tech, latest piece of tech for elderly people come to market because it's so, so necessary. So um, thank you. It's been great. great to thank talk. you for the opportunity. Thank you.